Amen. You may be seated. We are on our series at the present time. And our series is Team Jesus. And so what I have done over the course of now, counting today, the last four weeks, is we have taken the word team and made an acrostic out of it, right? And uh, in the acrostic, the first letter is T, and the letter T equaled what? Tired. I think all of us can find ourselves uh, relating to that, right? Where we just feel tired. Well, we live in a society today where life is so fast-paced that it's almost impossible not to feel tired by the end of the day i mean just things are happening and if you turn on the tv that wears you out right and we just everything is drawing all the energy out of us we're tired but yet the scripture is very clear to tell us all you that labor and are heavy laden come to me and i will give you rest and we can find rest to our weary soul even when we're tired and then the second week we talked about the letter e and the letter e equaled what empty and so there's a time where we can feel tired but then even there are times where we're, we might find strength not to be so tired but yet we feel like we're running on empty right and it's amazing that God is willing to take a tired and empty person and use them and then the next week we talk about the letter a in team and the letter a equals what anointed and so we may be tired, we may be empty, but praise God, we are anointed. We are anointed for something huge. It's we are called out, we are anointed for something much bigger. Now today I want to talk to you about the letter M. All right, the letter M. And the letter M is going to equal today the word message, or uh, messenger. All right, we are a messenger and I don't want you to miss this, so we are a tired, empty, anointed messenger. Praise God that we can be a tired, empty, anointed messenger. I don't know if that's where you find yourself today, but understand this, that that is a person who's on Team Jesus. That's an amazing thing to know. Because oftentimes when we think of, you know, if, if you were putting an all-star team together, right? And we had an all-star team that went to the Olympics one year. Remember that with Michael Jordan and, and, and Pippins and some, uh, I mean, some of the greatest. And they went and, of course, they dominated, right? We would, we would look at it like this is Team Jesus. Jesus is going to get the top of the cut. The no, he gets the tired, empty, anointed messengers on his team. That puts us right in, in line to being on Team Jesus. And I love that. But God's ways are not man's ways, and man's ways are not God's ways. How we would do it is not how God does it. God takes the broken, the simple things, and He confounds the wise with those things. So we all fit in the category of being able to fit right there into Team Jesus. And I love that. So I'd like for us to look here in Romans chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse number 14 and following. It says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who have believed what he has heard from us? Look at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Here's what I want to do. I want to unpack this verse for you this morning. I want to kind of lay out some things here that I would encourage you to write down so that you can remember them. All right? First, I want you to take a look in Team Jesus as the letter M representing messenger, we need to understand that there must be a believable message that is spoken. Look with me, if you would, here in verse number 14. It says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not what? Believed. There must be a believable message that is spoken. Now, you say, Pastor, you know, the Word of God is a believable message. But I want you to understand there's more to it than just 
regurgitating the things of God's Word. Just because you regurgitate the Word of God, just because you speak what God's Word says, doesn't mean that somebody sees the connection there. Here's what I don't want you to miss this morning. That if it's going to be a believable message, it has to be an embraced message. It has to be a message that has been applied to our own life. There's no greater believable message than when somebody shares something from their heart that has been a personal experience. You just can't help but believe what they're saying because they've encountered it. It's an encountered message. I've heard people share the gospel of Jesus, and boy, they hit every point. They quote every verse. They hit everything just right, but it's very robotic, and it's very factual, and at the end of the day, people are walking away going, okay, that was kind of weird. <laughs> you know why? Because it wasn't believable. How can you share something you've not encountered? And how can you not share something that you have encountered? Please don't miss this this morning. I want you to know that if we are going to be the messengers that God has called us to be, we have to make certain that we share the message and not allow our preconceived ideas of, and this is the thing that I've had people say to me, Pastor, but I don't know all the scripture. I don't know all the verses. I wouldn't know where to take them. And I say, look, all you need to do is share your encounter that you personally have had with Jesus. There was a man that was in the temple. And Jesus came through and healed him of his blindness. This man was so excited. He was running around. He was shouting. He was rejoicing that he could see. And the temple leaders looked at him and said, Hey, hey, calm down. What's going on here? You know, he said, Jesus, he, he healed me. I was blind and, 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 and I can see. And, and, and they're going, well, you know, is this real? Is this true? Yes, I've been blind since birth. And so he, the temple leaders go to his parents and say, Hey, is this true? Was your son blind? And they're kind of freaked out because they know if they go against the, the religious leaders there of the temple that they will be disbarred from the temple. So rather than putting themselves in that position, they're like, you know what? He's an adult. He's old enough. Ask him. He'll tell you. So they go back to him and they say, tell us about this Jesus that supposedly healed you. And he looked at him. Now listen to this. Here's what he said. All right, I'm going to paraphrase for a minute. He said, I don't know all the scriptures. I can't tell you all the details. Can't even really tell you a verse and a passage. Or I can't tell you. That. All right, he didn't say all that. But here's what he did say. He said, I can't tell you much about Jesus. I really don't know a whole lot about him. But this one thing I can say. Once I was blind, but now I see. And I think we use the excuse, I just don't know enough to be able to open my mouth and share Jesus with other people. But listen, all you need to do is share what you have encountered in your relationship with Jesus. It's a believable message. That's why God sends us out, to be His witnesses, to share the good news. Now, am I saying you shouldn't learn the Word of God? Am I saying that you shouldn't be able to grow to where you could share Scripture? I am not saying that. I'm saying that you don't have to wait until you got it all together. All you got to do is have this encounter with Jesus and then God makes you available to share that encounter with others. And we ought to. We're to be His messengers. It needs to be a believable message. That's so important. Then look at the next part. It says, and how are they to believe in Him in whom they have not heard? Or, well, let, me, let me back up a minute. How will, they, how will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Okay, it needs to be a believable message. And how are they to believe in Him in whom 
They have not heard. I want you to see this. There's a couple things here. One, it needs to be a clear message. There doesn't need to be... You need to be careful that when you share Jesus with other people that you don't go on a tangent. You don't start talking politics and all these other things. Listen, you may be very politically minded and you have a lot of opinion about a lot of stuff, but who cares? What matters is that Jesus can change their trajectory of of, of eternity. And we don't need to lose sight of that clear message of what Christ needs to do in the heart and life of other people. Now, when I've witnessed the people, my dad, I remember in, in, um, in witnessing training, one of the things he, he often would say, he'd say when you're trying to share something with somebody, somebody will always try to get you off track of the message. And here's how they do it. I got a question for you. That's always one that causes you to go, oh, great. <laughs> right? Oh, no, here it comes. I got a question for you. If God be God, then why does God let this happen? Or if, uh, you know, I, I heard that in the Bible it says this or says that, and it's something off course. Here's what you do with that. You ready? And I've learned this. My dad taught me this, and I've used it, and it works every single time. I'll say. That's a good question. You mind if I come back to that here in just a few moments? Yeah, that's fine. And I stay clear and on target to what I'm sharing with them about Jesus and what he wants to do in their life. And every single person that I've had the privilege of leading to the Lord in that moment, when we get done praying, I look at them, I go, okay, now, to go back to the question that you were asking, 99% of the time, you know what they say? Ah, it really doesn't matter anyway. Because their need was met. Satan was trying to, to de derail the whole subject. He is trying to derail where things were going. And if you keep it on track, you keep it clear, I'm just telling you, if they give their life to Jesus, then all of a sudden, all those questions they had just really don't even matter anymore. Their answers have been found in this Jesus. Keep it clear. But not only keep it clear, but it also needs to be a hearable message. It needs to be a clear message. It needs to be a hearable message. You know how many times I've had people say to me, you know, preacher, you know, I'm just not one to say a whole lot. And so I just kind of let my life show Jesus to others. But how shall they hear unless there be someone to, sp to speak it? Did you know we are encouraged, we are an anointed messenger that we are to literally share the message. We are to speak the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? We live in a terribly destructive, self-gratifying society that just, it's like it's it's going over a cliff. You feel like that? Do you feel like that? I mean, if you look and notice everything that's going on, it's like, oh my goodness, things are horrible, right? But can I say something? Things are terrible. But the good news is... Oh, it's amazing when I said that. You will not imagine every face in the building went... You know, there's just something about telling people, but the good news is. Did you know the gospel is the good news? That's what it is. If when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not bad news, it's good news. And so we need to make sure that we're letting people know, and I have been challenged through some of my study and reading, that not only do I need to understand the concept that the message of salvation is good news. I need to say to people, but the good news is Jesus. But the good news is there's hope even in this what seems to be a very hopeless world. Let me tell you about that good news. You have people's attention at that point. Don't miss this. 
Those very words coming out of your mouth rip down the walls that people oftentimes will put up when you start to witness to them. Oh, here he goes, he's going to start preaching to me. But when you say the words, but the good news is that puts people at ease because everybody wants to hear some good news. We hear enough of the opposite, right? You turn on your TV and you feel like maybe you need to lock the doors and, and bar the doors, Katie, right? Never go outside again. That's what you think if you listen to the news and all that's said. But I want you to know this, that there is good news, and that good news is in Jesus Christ, and that needs to be a message that's heard. And here's the awesome part. We live in a day today where it goes beyond. Back in the day, the only time that the message could be heard is if you went into town and went to the grocery or whatever, and then you could talk and have conversation with people, or if you got on the party line... Speaking of those who understand what I'm talking about, there's others here going, what? It's a party line. Well, you ain't lived life unless you, unless you used a party line. You're going, that sounds like fun. I like parties. Well, this one wasn't no fun. And Susie is probably listening to everything you had to say on the party line. But, or you had to go to church. And you had conversations with each other. But today... We can, we can conversate with somebody in real time around the world with social media. Our cell phones. Texting. All the different aspects that are out there. Listen, we have an opportunity for the message to be heard today on a level like we've never had the opportunity for it to be heard. That's why as a church we have to navigate all those things and do our very best to embrace those opportunities that God gives us. That's why we put the message out on YouTube and on Facebook and different things. It gives us the opportunity to get the message beyond the walls of this church, even beyond the walls of our state, even beyond the walls of America. We can send it around the world where people can see and to hear the message. And we need to embrace those opportunities. And as a church, we have to learn how to navigate these new opportunities that God puts in front of us. So we're always trying to grow and to be used on whatever level God will allow us to do that. But not only do we need to do that as a ministry, you need to do that as an individual. Because the message, how will they hear unless somebody tells them? We all have a responsibility to be used for other people to hear. So, as a messenger, the message has to be a hearable message. How it says there, how shall they be how shall they hear? And how will they hear without someone preaching? It has to be heard. That means it has to be a clear message. And then how will it be heard without someone preaching? So someone has to go. And then it goes on to say in verse number 15, and how are they to preach unless they are what? Sent. How will you be a messenger? How will I be a messenger unless I'm sent? Now I realize this passage has oftentimes been used centered around missions, right? Oh, we have missionaries that need to go and preach the gospel around the world. And that is a true statement. But I, don't, I do not believe that this passage is only about missionaries going around the world it's about every one of us being a missionary outside the walls of this church and going across the street and going into the grocery store and going into our family reunions and our, even within our own home and that we go and how shall we go lest we be sent Here's what I want you to understand that I see this as. That means, how will they go unless they've been equipped? You and I need to be equipped to go. We need to be prepared. We need to be, we need to be given the right tools to use, to share Jesus. That doesn't mean we wait until we're fully equipped. We should begin right now when the man who had the legion of demons that were in him, and Jesus cast out those demons, he told that man to go back to his home and, 
and, and to, to let Jesus and what God has done in his life be seen and experienced by those in his home. And I mentioned this, I think I mentioned this last week, that when Jesus did that, and he cast that legion of demons, which is in the vicinity of 3,000 to 5,000 demons that were in that one man, when he cast them out into the herd of 3,000 swine, the scripture says they ran into the water and they drowned themselves, and the people were so upset with Jesus, they demanded that he leave their territory and get away from them. They were scared of him. But here's the awesome part. Here's the good news. You like that? Here's the good news. It was only a very short amount of time, and I don't know exactly what the amount of time was, that that region began to beg Jesus to come back into their territory. What changed? You know what changed? A messenger went, and he shared the experience of his encounter with the message. And it began to change people's lives until it permeated that whole region. And that whole region began to beg for Jesus to come back into their territory. The very people who were demanding that he leave. You see how that works? It wasn't an overnight thing. It wasn't like the very next day everybody's like, Hey, wait a minute, let's go ahead and have Jesus come back here. It took time. And the messenger had to be faithful of sharing his encounter. We are messengers that need to be equipped. We need to grow in the things of God's Word. And if we are going to be equipped, here's the words that I'm kind of laying out here to you. Two words that start with an M as well. We are to be mentored messengers. Mentored messengers. We need to be mentored. That word mentor just simply means to be discipled. What was the very first thing that Jesus did when he came out of the wilderness? He was baptized by John the Baptist. And then when he came up out of the water, he went out. And what did he do at that point? He began to call his what? His disciples to come follow him. Those that he was going to mentor. Those he was going to to equip for the work of the ministry. That's what he was there to do. I want you to understand this. If we are going to be messengers, we need to be mentored messengers. Now let me just say this. You're one of two people today. If you're a born-again believer, you're one of two people. You ready to hear this? You're one of two people. You're either somebody who needs to be mentored, discipled, or you're somebody who needs to be mentoring or discipling. You're only one of two people. Those are the categories God gives us. We either need to be discipled or we need to be discipling. That's our job as a messenger. If you are on Team Jesus, you might be tired, you might be emptied, but understand that you are anointed messenger of God and we have to trust God to see us through to accomplish what needs to be done. And if we're going to be a good messenger, we have to be equipped. We have to have a game plan. If you're going to be on a team, there has to be a, there has to be a good game plan, right? You have, to have, you have to have those game plans. When I played basketball, there was a series of different plays that we learned. And there would be times where a coach would go, okay, guys, when we go back out now, here's the plan. Here's, the, here's, the, here's what we're going to run. This is going to be the one that we're doing right here. And we go out there, and sure enough, we'd run it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But I can tell you this, if we didn't have a game plan, we'd just all be running around like chickens with their head cut off, just doing our own thing. And we're not going to be as effective as a team when we do that. And so we have to be equipped we ought to all be doing the same thing with the same mind, the same heart. And so I'm just letting you know today that one of the pursuits that we have as a church this year is I am pursuing that God will take us and that He will let us then engross ourselves in discipleship, that we're finding ourselves discipled and equipped and prepared for what God has in store for us as anointed, as in anointed messengers of His.
So what does that look like exactly? Well, let me do this. I would like to read something that I, I had found. I thought this was really good, and it words it in a way, I think, that just kind of brings it home. Listen to this passage, verse number 17. I'm going to give it to you one more time to listen to it this way. So faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. I love that. It's about hearing, the, because that whole passage is about the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's all about hearing the good news about Christ. You know, when we hear faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, we think, oh my goodness, that means I need to know all the verses and all the passages and be able to, and I, I just don't, so I can't help somebody grow in their faith because I can't give them all the Scriptures and all the Word of God. I can't, but you can tell them about the good news about Christ. And their faith grows when they hear about the good news of Christ. See how important your testimony is, your witness is? We need to be witnesses. And here's what I want you to understand in closing. All of this centers around hearing the good news about Christ. That's what it all centers around. It's about the good news of Christ. Now, if you haven't encountered the good news of Jesus Christ, you need to be saved. Because that's what salvation is. It's encountering the good news of Jesus... And once you encounter the good news, it becomes, you've encountered it, it's become personal. Then you surrender yourself as a fully devoted follower of Jesus, doing exactly what the Scripture says, that all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And last week I said that I kind of broke that down. Your, mind, uh, your heart being your seat of emotion. Your soul. I said this is Kellogg theology. I'm kind of sticking with it right now. Because I, I, it just seems to continue to come into clarity to me. That the soul is your loyalty. What have you sold your soul to? Right? Your soul is your loyalty, so we love the Lord our God with all our loyalty, that we just surrender it all to Him, that with all of our mind, that's all of our, our reasoning ability, and all of our strength, that has to do with our endurance. With all of our endurance. We're to love the Lord our God with all these things. And I believe that that is a true picture of what salvation is, is when a person has come to that place where they've surrendered it all to Christ, understanding He is the one who saves us. It's through Him and Him alone. It's not by what we have done. It's what He has done on our behalf. And in encountering that relationship of His good news, it converts the heart and the soul and it causes us then to be in that place where we just want to surrender these things to Christ and we grow in him to understand that and to know that I want you to know today you are anointed messenger of Jesus Christ if you are truly on team Jesus you are an anointed messenger of Jesus Christ so if I were to go around the auditorium today, every person individually, every one of you, and I was come and I were to ask you to put a face on the fact that you are an anointed messenger of God, what does that look like in your life? And how are you living that out? Would you be like, oh man, preacher, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. Is that where you'd find yourself? We need to find ourselves in that place where we are embracing the calling God has put on our life. We are anointed messengers. So what are you doing with that? Every head bowed, never eye closed.